So the Emperor Outcomes Trial uh, enrolled a little over 7,000 patients. These were the patients who had diabetes and had atherosclerotic vascular disease. So they may have coronary disease, angina, they may have peripheral vascular disease, but some sort of atherosclerotic disease, and randomized them to empagliflozin or placebo. And what the trial found, we for a very long time know that certain therapies by glucose control or other means can reduce microvascular risk reduction. But what this trial found was that macrovascular risk reduction, the primary endpoint was MACE, major adverse cardiovascular event, was reduced by around 15%, which is highly statistically significant. Cardiovascular death by itself was reduced around 38% relative risk reduction. So this was actually the first trial ever to show reduction in mortality in high-risk diabetic patients with the use of this agent called empagliflozin, which is a, a SGLT2 inhibitor. So what was interesting was that although development of heart failure was not a primary endpoint, diabetic patients are at a particularly high risk of developing heart failure. So in the secondary analysis, what they found is that those patients in Empiric trial who did not have baseline heart failure, so about 90% or about 6,300 patients, in those patients, there was a very robust 35% relative risk reduction in new onset heart failure. And those results were then replicated by another clinical trial called CANVAS uh, with another SGLT2 inhibitor called canagliflozin that also showed a 35% or so relative risk reduction in new onset heart failure. So now that we had this robust data, what we wanted to do was to see whether this risk reduction is modulated by your baseline heart failure risk. So if you're really not at a very high risk, do you still get the benefit or, or is the benefit only limited to those who are at very high risk? So what we found was that we divided the patients into three groups. So these were the patients who did not have heart failure at baseline, about 6,300 patients. We divided them into those with low to average risk, which is a projected risk of less than 10% over the next five years high risk, those who were 10 to 20% risk, and very high risk, those who were more than 20% risk. And we looked at the benefit of empagliflozin and heart failure risk reduction, and what we found was that there was about a 29% relative risk reduction in low to average risk and about a 45% in high and very high risk group. So what was very heartening was that one was expecting a risk reduction pretty robust in high risk patient but it was the low to average risk patients that also benefited by about a 30% relative risk reduction, and pretty much the benefit was seen across the risk spectrum. I mean, regardless of uh, our study uh, that, that we presented, uh, just the fact that now two SGLT2 inhibitors have shown a three-point MACE reduction, which is the primary endpoint, I think we are entering a new era in the management of diabetes where the therapies need to be targeted beyond just microvascular risk reduction in terms of progression of nephropathy or retinopathy and actually look at cardiovascular mortality by itself. So I think hopefully the guidelines will slowly change and these agents will become preferable agents. But from our perspective, two trials showing a 35% relative risk reduction for heart failure and now us showing that that risk reduction is across the spectrum of heart failure risk uh, is really uh, gives us the ammunition that diabetic patients need to be treated very aggressively for all cardiovascular risk prevention. I mean, I think the cardiologist should definitely be more involved in cardiovascular mortality prevention strategies in patients with diabetes. Now, the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of patients with diabetes are in the primary care uh, setting, and then a good proportion are in the uh, uh, endocrine uh, setting. Uh, so even if they don't want to manage diabetes themselves, what was interesting in, uh, in the Emperor trial, that the 10 milligram and the 25 milligram, both of them had actually the same benefit. Uh, so the cardiovascular benefit was irrespective of the dose, and was irrespective of the hemoglobin A1C changes. So in a way, one can argue that you can give, as a cardiologist, these drugs for cardiovascular risk prevention like we treat lipids. But honestly, it doesn't matter because even if you don't want to give an anti-diabetic drug or treat diabetes, if you can partner with your primary care physician and endocrinologist and say that this option is also available with a pretty robust risk reduction, I think then we will still be doing our job better than perhaps what we are doing now.